So this video is going to talk you through some additional source material that I have um, done through some research that you might find useful for topics around religion and also for sophists which are linked to religion. Um, this video came about because of the experience I had marking in 2022. So there was a question about religion which generally was not answered particularly well particularly um, in the use of source material. So with that in mind, um, I went through some stuff that I have and I found some additional sources that you might find useful. None of these sources are set by the exam board, so you are welcome to ignore them if you so wish, but you might find them useful if a religion question comes back up again. So the first section um, of this video is going to talk you through some kind of general quotes about religion and some of the religious festivals. And there's going to be a big range of different authors, some of them um, we've not really come across before, some of them that we already use. Um, the first set of sources is talking about the Eleusian Mysteries, which was a religious festival stroke religious cult that was a mystery, hence why they're called the Mysteries. Um, they were women only, it was highly secretive. Most of, if not the vast majority, of the festivals held in secret. The only bit that was seen was people sort of going off to be initiated into this particular religious festival and religious cult. So the source material that we're going to look at is not going to necessarily say very much, to be honest, but it gives us some really good evidence about the role of women in the Athenian democracy, as this was a women only festival. Change my pen to a pointer. There we go. So we have um, Isocrates, who is one of the sources that we have for religion in general terms. So um, he talks about what the festival's based around, which is about Demeter and Persephone. So if you don't know much about the myth Greek mythology, this particular story is um, around the kidnap of Persephone by Hades. So Hades basically fell in love with Persephone and or stole her. There's no other way of phrasing it. Um, her mother was very upset and Demeter was one of the goddesses of like the harvest and food and, and things like that. So when Persephone was missing, uh, Demeter became very depressed and she basically stopped caring for the world and she was kind of just wandering around trying to find her. And all the crops started dying, everything kind of went um, horribly wrong and there was no food. In order, this is like a really shortened version of the myth, in order to stop that from happening in the future, a deal was struck with um, Hades. So um, Persephone is allowed, was allowed out of uh, the underworld for around about six months of the year. And while Persephone is out in the sort of you know, upper world, as it were, her mother is happy and you have warm weather and lots of bountiful fruits and crops, etc. And when Persephone then has to go back into the underworld, you then have the deaths of crops, etc. So that is where the belief comes from spring and summer when Persephone's with her mother, Demeter. And then you have winter and autumn when obviously Persephone's back in the underworld. So the Elysian mysteries are around this particular story. So um, this particular source points out that only initiative, initiates, sorry, I can't speak, um, may hear what basically happens in these um, Elysian cults, in Elysian mysteries. So that's kind of why we don't know very much. And it tells us that we know it's around to do with crops and the holy rite that brings us to crops. So that's the only thing that Isocrates is aware of, because, like I said, the whole thing's in secret. We then have um, a little section from Aristophanes' Frogs. I can't remember what Frogs is about. It's, it doesn't really matter. But again, we have a chorus of initiates. So these are people who have um, joined the Lucian cult. So go around the sacred precinct of the goddess in flower laden grove. I will go girls and women to bear the holy torch where they celebrate the goddess's rites all night through. So we know it appears to be a night. We know that there's a torch, so like a procession. And we know that there are women and girls. So this is a really good source to show how little we know about it. But also importantly, that it's um, participation of women in the Athenian democracy, which is quite nice. We then have Sophocles, who was a playwright. He wrote tragedies. And he talks about how thrice blessed are those mortals who pace past the Hades after seeing these mysteries. So there was obviously, although a lot of misunderstanding and sort of secret secrecy, that's not even a word, secrecy around the, the cult, um, it was obviously held in some high regard because um, those who would join the mystery would then be looked on favourably um, when he went to the underworld. So there you go. We then have another section about Aristophanes. 
there's quite a nice bit about the beliefs around Zeus, which I haven't highlighted. Zeus is ordained the death and found up this peace. This particular play is based around trying to sign a peace treaty in the Peloponnesian War, sort of around the time of the Peace of Nicias. And essentially, two people go off and do it on their own and they make peace and they bury the peace treaty. This is why I started digging up this peace, trying to pre prevent peace being broken. Um, the more important thing is that we have. Um, this particular character who wants to become an initiative initiative initiate sorry when they die before they die sorry so again shows the importance of this particular mystery so i'm having a fight with my computer come on So the next um, sort of sources is talking about the rise of rationalism and scepticism. So it's quite easy to think of the uh, Athenians as being highly religious. Everybody had blind faith in the gods, etc., etc. And actually, there's quite a lot of source material that suggests that while, yes, there was very strong religious belief in Athens, not everybody was blindly um, following the gods or blindly um, Sort of going through omens etc so that's what these um, sets of sources are talking about so we have um four sections from different plays by euripides and euripides as we would have seen um, in lesson if you've done this video last is a strategic playwright so um i don't know the plots of all of these but essentially helen is about the helen of troy um, being kind of kidnapped by Paris, etc. And Trojan Women is about the aftermath of the um, Trojan Wars and the women who were kidnapped and sold into slavery, etc. So not that particularly matters, just so you know what's going on. So we have um, what is God or not God or in between, seeing the divine leaping this way and that and back again by chance, it's flickable, unhoped for. So again, it's just the idea of this questioning of religion, like what is a God? How do gods work? um this idea this understanding sorry that the gods seem to be moving in kind of really mysterious ways and really um erratically so again is it sort of is it real um, we're not sure they're not saying there is no god they're just sort of going things don't quite make sense um on the other hand we then have this particular character who's giving a prayer um to zeus partly because of her situation, so uphold of the earth and throned over the earth, so talking about Zeus, compelling law of nature or the mind of man. But it does say whoever you are, so either you are a god, a compelling law of nature, or you're just kind of made up. So again, this kind of questioning about religion. Same in the Heracles um, section, for God, if he is truly God, needs nothing. So again, do you really need to worship the gods because the gods don't seem to do very much. And this is kind of picked up on Euripides, this last um, section of the diseases of mankind. Some are self-inflicted, others come from the gods. So they are, there is this awareness that not everything that goes wrong in people's lives is because of the gods. It's also because men are just, well, not men, sorry, humans are just, well, human and we do bad things to each other. Um, and it also suggests that if the gods do anything reprehensible, so if they do anything truly awful, then they're not really gods, are they? If they're being really horrible to people um, and causing suffering. This carries on um, in a, quite a variety of different authors. You can tell I was reading a particular book with lots of different things. I do apologise for the size of the text as well. I'm doing this on a PowerPoint um, differently from how I used to do them. So then we have... Um, a section that's really focusing on particular sophists, so these wise teachers that went around um, Athens. And some of them were teaching, remember, things like maths, geometry, um, music, rhetoric is the big topic. And a lot of them were teaching science. Um, there was lots of big scientific discoveries at this, during this period that we still use today. So these um, particular sophists that are mentioned here are kind of, again, questioning the the extent of which the gods existed if at all and one of them is actually called an atheist in here so we have protagoras not my greek pronunciations um so he is sort of again questioning what the gods are so the first bit is my introduction to what he's talking about i won't read all the way through that but um he says in a book about the gods i am unable to know whether they exist or that they do not so again he's not saying there are no gods he's just also saying I don't know if there are gods 
and I don't know how to prove that there are gods. So that is again questioning of religion. And according to um, Di Diogenes, I don't know how you pronounce his name, it was because of the start of this start to his book that he was expelled by the Athenians who burned his books in the marketplace. So there's obviously a lot of as well really strong religious belief in Athens because otherwise would why would they excel excel exile sorry um protagoras unless what he was saying was challenging religious belief so you've got kind of evidence of two things here you've got evidence of the skepticism and this rationalism that's growing and you've also got evidence then that there's this pushback against that skepticism by people who had very strong beliefs <laughs> Um, if you heard a weird sound in the background, that was my phone. I'm really sorry. Um, this is one of my favourite ones. So this is another sophist called Antiphon. And I just subscribed to what he says here. So Antiphon was asked what prophecy was. And he said, a guess by a sensible man. So again, it's this idea that not everybody was blindly supporting what prophecy said. That people like him were sort of going, yeah, but let's be honest. It's all a bit of a guess, isn't it? And you can make these... Um, intelligent guesses if you're thinking about things carefully for a philosopher which i can understand uh we then have xenophon who remember um is writing about socrates his mentor so everything he talks about is trying to praise um socrates so you have this guy here astro demos says i certainly don't despise deity socrates i reckon it too high and mighty to need my attention but in that case if something high and mighty deigns to pay attention to you you ought to pay all more respect so this idea that you should be worshipping the gods if the gods are kind, well, not kind to you, but respecting you. And I wouldn't neglect the gods if I thought they paid any heed to man. But there's also that questioning of like, well, if I thought the gods were really listening, then I would worship properly. But clearly some of the gods don't care. So why should I worship them? It's quite an interesting point. Now, slightly randomly, you have a source in Cicero. Um, he wrote a lot about uh, Greeks, because Romans were obsessed with the Greeks. So that's why I picked this, this couple of bits from Cicero, another one a little bit later. Picked out a couple of things from him, because he's writing about sophists and philosophy. So he talks about Diagoras, who is an atheist, called the atheist. So again, we have this person who clearly says there is no religion. So that's quite a nice quote to have. Um, and someone was talking to Diagoras and said, you think the gods are heedless of human affairs and they don't care? How many people have by their prayers escaped the violence of the storm and reached the harbour safely? Good question. People pray to the gods for protection and they are safe. Surely this must mean there are gods. And Diagoras says, well, that's because there are no painted tablets of those who suffered shipwreck and perished in the seas. So he's just kind of making the point that it's kind of this um, confirmation bias. You may have heard that phrase before. It's used quite a lot about life. So because you want to believe in the gods, you see the evidence of the gods existing. So those who survived have given said, oh, I gave a prayer to Poseidon or whatever. And therefore, that's why I'm alive. And Diagoras is kind of going, yeah, but what about those who said that prayer and died anyway? You don't have evidence of those, do you? Because, you know, they're dead, which is a fair point. So, again, it's just this kind of rationalism, a bit of scepticism saying mm, just because people are praying and surviving doesn't actually mean anything's happening. We then have Plutarch writing about Nicias. Now, Nicias is a highly, highly religious guy. Um, you may or may not remember from when we did the Sicilian expedition. And Plut Plutarch, uh, Nicias uh, what was for? delayed their exit from Sicily because he saw an eclipse and he saw this as a sign of the gods that he can't leave uh, Sicily at that particular point as a bad omen. So this is talking about those use of omens, particularly around eclipses. So the majority thought that the eclipse of the sun around the 13th of the month was due to the moon. So this shows there is scientific understanding that eclipses are caused by the moon going in front of the sun in terms of our path. So that is, again, kind of rationalism. It's a rational understanding of the world. Um, they thought it was strange that a sign from God was being revealed, heralding some great disasters. So they're sort of saying... <laughs> Is it really sort of an omen? It's just science. It's literally just science. Anasagoras, who was another sophist, um, sorry, talks about sort of this bit saying he writes about eclipses, essentially. And unfortunately, his work on eclipses wasn't really given any good reputation. So this is kind of be counter to what I've just said, that some are saying, oh, it's clearly science. Because it says people were intolerant of natural scientists and so-called stargazers because they reduced providence to irrational causes and random powers. 
So because you've got people like Anatagoras, who is sort of saying, look, this is science. It's just astronomy. Astronomy? Astronomy. Astronomy. I can't say the word. You know what I'm trying to say? Stars. Um, it's not the gods. It's just life. And there are people who don't like this because... People want to believe that there's a reason why things happen. People want to believe that fate is a thing and that you have your life set out in a path by some higher power. Still true to this day. And they don't like the idea that it's just by chance and like life happens. And it's nothing more than that. There is no grand plan for you. You're just kind of bobbling along, hoping for the best. And um, it says here Anatagoras was imprisoned. So people were that angry about what he was saying that actually had the sophists been jailed for questioning religion. And Socrates was later um, executed because of this philosophy, the idea that there are no gods. And obviously, if you've done this video after the stuff of Socrates, you'll know that's not entirely true why he was executed. But that was the charges he was facing was around um, blasphemy and the denial of the gods. Talking about Socrates, who, um, again, if you've watched this after we've done Socrates, you will know that I don't particularly like Socrates. I find him a little bit irritating, to be honest. But um, but anyway, um, again, we needed some sources that just kind of show what Socrates is trying to achieve and his aims and his writings and all that sort of all that jazz. So that's why I have included these particular sources. So, again, we have Plato, who was a student of Socrates and sort of talks about how wonderful he is here and he's sort of you know talking to lots of people and he's a wonderful guy however um he does point out that he was attracting the ridicule of people with no, of people sorry with no knowledge or sense so essentially because socrates is going around questioning everything people didn't really understand what he's trying to achieve and as a result of that people took the mick out of him because they didn't understand him which is true um and then he said, if you actually read his ideas, you'll see they contain name, numerous images of the virtue covering the widest possible range, including every subject suitable for study by anyone with pretensions to, to being a gentleman. Remember, Socrates is trying to use questioning to help people sort of understand the world better and understand themselves better and form better arguments. That's all he was ever trying to do. And he thought wisdom and vir was a virtue and being virtuous was being wise. So the two things kind of go together. And that's what his whole philosophy is around. So then we have Plato in another section of a source. Um, first quote we've really got that shows what Socrates was doing. So because of the unfam unfamiliarity with the question and answer technique. So that's what Socrates is doing, question and answering technique. They feel they are being gradually led astray by each question. So remember, Socrates is basically trying to get people to justify their thought processes better. So he would you would say your opinion then he would ask you why i have that opinion and then he'd drill down into it it's called the socratic uh, questioning technique uh, teachers use it it's very irritating <laughs> let's be honest um and at the end of the argument the conclusion is catastrophic and quite the reverse of the starting point so the whole point is supposed to make you question what you have said in order to create more wisdom that's why teachers use it so you might say oh i think the sky is green i'm just picking a stupid example and like a teacher or Socrates would be like, and why do you think it's green? And then you kind of go on from there. And in the end, the person might kind of go, well, I accept that my original point about the sky being green is not true because blah, 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 blah. And um, the, the source says that people feel like they've been kind of trapped into sort of speaking, sort of changing their minds. It's particularly possible games like a kind of version of checkers, I think, or chess and have nothing else to say. So people don't like being made to feel like they're a fool. And that might be part of the reason why um, people don't like Socrates. Part of the reason why I don't like him. We then have this other section on, by Cicero, again, talking about Socrates. So ancient philosophy was concerned with numbers and movements and the origins and destinations of everything. So that's what it was like before Socrates. And then Socrates was the first to bring philosophy down to earth. He located it in the cities of men. So it's about trying to make people think about here. Well, life and morals, what is good and what is bad. So trying to make the point that I will highlight that because that would be really useful. It's going to be a bit wonky. Sorry, excuse my singing. Oh, that's cool. Um, so again, it's just trying to make people wiser, not necessarily um, win an argument. It's trying to make them think more critically. It's that kind of um, critical thinking that is really important to, to life in general. Last set of sources on Socrates, my favourite guy. 
my pointer back. So again, I have Aristotle. Uh, Socrates is concerned with moral virtues, um, about creating, in, creating sorry, inductive arguments and definitions. Both belong to the root of knowledge. So again, just the idea of making sure your arguments are fully supported, but, but being wise, being moral. So you get this, this is going to be very repetitive, this particular set of sources. Aristotle again talks about Socrates, thought the true objective was understanding virtue. He sought to discover what morality is, what courage is, and what the comp their parts are. So what kind of makes somebody courageous and virtuous? Um, because he thought all virtues were forms of knowledge. So if you're a virtuous person, if you think properly, then therefore you are wise and therefore you are a moral person. Uh, Xenophon said, Socrates said that justice and every other form of virtue is wisdom. So fine and good things are done by wise people. Since every just or unwise, fine and good action is virtuous, just as every form of wisdom is, is uh, every form of virtue is wisdom. So in order to be wise, you have to be virtuous. In order to be virtuous, you have to be wise. So it kind of goes around like a circle to the joy of philosophy. Said so again, uh, Socrates often. Oh, sorry, this before I go on to this bit. So these last two sources, I forgot about this, um, is basically the arguments against why Socrates was being put on trial. So Socrates' trial was about him um, being blasphemous for denying gods, for worshipping fake gods and for corrupting the youth of the nation because of reasons, because he's pain, I guess. But that's not the official reason. Don't write that in an essay. So Socrates, so sorry, these two Xenophon sources are basically trying to show that he was a religious guy. So Socrates was seen to be sacrificing at home or on the communal st state altars. He made no secret use of divination and he claimed to receive the signs from the deity. So Socrates himself is not an atheist and he's not worshipping different gods. He was worshipping all the main gods and the state gods and the private gods. So he was just doing what every other Athenian was doing. And then Xenophon makes this point again a little bit later. No one ever knew Socrates. No one ever knew Socrates do anything or say anything that offended against piety and religion. He even avoided discussing the popular topic of cosmology because he was like, the gods are the gods. I'm not going to question these gods. So hopefully um, these sources have helped you sort of get some more information about some of the some festivals, particularly the use in mysteries, the role of women, um, the sort of growth of rationalism and scepticism in Athens, and then also um, the Socrates method for getting people to question their beliefs, also their arguments and creating what he was believing in, which is about virtue and wisdom. And also the fact that actually Socrates was religious, despite what his trial was trying to make him out to be.